Hi, my name is Sam Bowser. I'm a polar biologist and for the past 25 years I've worked on certain bottom dwelling organisms that inhabit McMurdo Sound, Antarctica. I've been collaborating with artists and writers through the National Science Foundation Artists and Writers Program since it began. This program is highly successful and I've enjoyed being involved in various projects ranging from Lisa Blatt's photography to Werner Herzog's uh, documentary filmmaking. One thing I'm curious about is the process by which artists and writers compete for logistical support. It's not unlike writing a science proposal. Uh, the artist and writer gets an idea, they develop a project, they get letters of support, for example from galleries or publishers. They put together a, a proposal and submit it and it's then evaluated by a peer panel. If there's money in the program and they get a positive review from the panel, then yay, they get supported. Uh, if not, well, try again next year. But I wonder if this process inhibits creativity. Doesn't it put the cart before the horse? And I wonder what happens when an artist doesn't get along with the science group that they're assigned to. In addition to hosting NSF artists and writers in my field camp, over the past five years I've also employed artists and writers as field assistants. They work for me by melting dive holes, tending dives, sorting samples, and assisting with camp maintenance. It can be grueling work at times, but also fun, informative, and sometimes even transformative. Because the artist fulfills his or her commitment through working for hire like everybody else in camp, they're free to subsequently digest the experience and, if they desire, to incorporate it into their art. In other words, the creative process follows the experience. I think this allows them to better communicate what it's like to do field research. Well, that's a hypothesis anyway. With an N of 3 so far, I can reject the null hypothesis with some confidence. I find artists to be well adapted to field research. They have excellent pattern recognition skills and excellent manual dexterity. And they're eager to share their results and findings. The surprises that result are delightful and they help enrich our science and outreach talks. So it's a win-win. In the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some of Laura von Rosk's activities during the 2011 field season, and we'll see how Antarctica influenced her art. Up just a teeny bit. Uh, okay, next. And here is Laura getting setting our downline. <laughs> now it goes to Kobasket. Goodbye. She's a professional. Good. I am now. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> are. are. <laughs> nope, you are definitely a professional. Hold on. Okay. I got it. Got it? Yep.
So I can understand why you would, you would and you spent a lot well, of time right there yeah, waiting that, for divers to come up. And stuff. That's one of the I images that I have in my head of of the whole trip. Is this? Um, we dropped one. It was the uh, like this blue green hole that I was always looking down. <laughs> Where are they? When are they coming up? I need to figure out what I want to do. Not what everybody else thinks I'm going to do. But for, you know, how many years now? 25 years painting landscapes. Moody, surreal landscapes. Everyone's going to say, oh, she's going to have some moody, surreal Antarctic landscapes. <laughs> I guess that's what I have. 